Hi, and welcome to my new series. I truly appreciate your viewership, and I really hope to give you some interesting and enlightening perspectives on music theory. The full crux of what I'm presenting here is to address the often neglected but highly essential role that the blues plays in music theory. In fact, what you're about to get is probably the most detailed and in-depth reverse engineering of the blues that you might have ever seen. A few weeks ago, I was sitting down to lunch with a good buddy of mine, the jazz piano master, Rob Mullins. We were talking about music theory when I told him about my recent ideas, and I happened to mention that the blues doesn't really have a theory. You're right, he emphatically agreed, there isn't a theory for the blues. When I went on to talk about some of my concepts, he was already off and running, and he then provided me with some valuable feedback regarding my system. Getting this kind of confirmation from a guy like Rob was important to me. After all, here's a guy who's a Grammy-nominated pianist who stands among his peers as one of the greatest jazz pianists in Los Angeles, if not the world. He also studied with the music theory giant George Russell, who developed the highly sophisticated Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization. So you can pretty much say Rob knows his theory. When we speak about reasonably tonal music, you can say that we analyze music, generally speaking, through two lenses, the Greek modes and the major minor key system. If all the chords of a piece come out of a major key and there are no chords introduced from outside that key, we're in the world of the Greek modes and that's that. It's that simple. As soon as a secondary dominant or tritone substitution chord enters the picture, however, now we're moving into the realm of the major minor key system, because this system allows for chords from other keys to be brought in. When looking at a piece of music, it's possible to find a number of measures whose chords can be analyzed with the Greek modes, and then later on in the piece, a section of the music might move into the major minor key system. Very often problems arise because one needs to know which system to use when. Now, what about chord phenomena that have nothing to do with the Greek modes or the major minor key system? For example, if I'm in the key of C major and an A flat major 7 shows up, what happens? How do I analyze that? I know of two ways that contemporary music theory nerds tend to explain this. The notion of borrowed chords states that I'm borrowing from the parallel minor key of C minor. If I lay out the chords of C major and compare the chords of C natural minor, I find out that yes indeed I can get the A flat major 7 chord. This is also true for chords like E flat major 7, F minor, or B flat 7. So really, if any chord at all shows up from C natural minor, it's called a borrowed chord. I call this phenomenon the parallel switch because we're just moving parallel from C major to C minor. Another popular explanation comes from the notion of negative harmony. This is a brilliant and elegant idea that highlights the yin-yang, dark light, positive and negative of music. Negative harmony takes the key of C and through a sophisticated process creates an axis. By using this axis, we can determine another key from it. This is some pretty complex stuff actually, but let's just say that if I extract what might be called the negative key of C through this process, the notes of the key of E flat are revealed. This is what I would call the parallel relative switch. That is, with the earlier idea of borrowed chords, we get the key of C natural minor, but since that's the relative minor of E flat, we can derive the key of E flat major. So in C, C natural minor is the parallel move and E flat major is the relative move. Before I knew about these theories, I came to the same conclusion that both of these systems came to, and I called it the parallel relative switch. The huge difference here, though, is that my conclusion came from a completely unexpected source. That is, the blues. The blues was never considered to be a system replete with its own theory. 
This is problematic for the sole reason that we only have these two systems of analysis, as I said, the Greek modes and the major minor key system. What I'm proposing here is now there is a real system of the blues, which I'm providing you with in this series. This is the third system of analyzing reasonably tonal music thoroughly. If my system and the other two theories I mentioned, that is the theory of bar chords and the theory of negative harmony, both came to the same conclusion that I did in my system, why bother producing these videos at all? I have reason to believe that my parallel relative switch theory with its decatonic blues model goes far beyond these two theories. Not only does it explain borrowed chords, but it shows you why these borrowed chords exist at all, the real reason why they work. My system not only clarifies and explains these borrowed chords, but it does a lot more than that. It explains, for example, the existence of the sharp nine chord, which cannot be built using any one conventional scale. Also, my system explains how a 12 bar blues, for example, uses a one, a four, and a five dominant seventh chord, which cannot be explained through any one key. You can't have three dominant seventh chords inside of one key. Here, Again, my problem arises with the major minor key system. Musicians need to be deprogrammed from the idea that root is key and key is root. They are two different entities. A scale is a key and a root is a note or chord that becomes a magnetic center, a center of gravity from within that key. So do bear in mind that when I say key, I'm referring to a scale and not a root. Yeah, you can say that a 12-bar blues whose root is G7 is emphatic quotes in the key of G, but this is really wrong. The root is G, the root chord is G7, and that's that. There is no key that can contain these three chords. When I explain the decatonic model, you might understand why the languaging I would use for a blues in G is better spoken as G decatonic. This is tantamount to saying a blues in G, but it drops the false notion that a key means a root. The blues is not coming from a key, though, as we know it. It's coming from a model, the decatonic model. The decatonic model, as you'll see described later on, isn't technically a scale. It's more like a meta scale from which proper scales, chords, and rips can be extracted, both diatonic and pentatonic. It's another system of organizing notes beyond the basic idea of a scale. For example, in some music theory circles, there's an argument going on about whether the natural minor, the harmonic minor, and melodic minor should be blended together as one big scale or whether they should remain separate entities. In my older Fragments of Infinity series, I describe how you can blend the notes of natural minor, the harmonic minor, and melodic minor within one minor key progression. I've demonstrated this so many times before that I don't want to belabor the issue. Most of my guitar and theory students will remember how I've made this a strong talking point in their lessons. Sure, these scales can be blended together, but this would defy the rules of what a diatonic scale actually is. I'm suggesting that, nonetheless, the notes can be brought together within one unit that can't be considered a scale, but as a model from which different note choices can be opted. I'm thinking of here like a meta scale from which can be derived a few proper diatonic scales. This kind of eniatonic or nine note model is one of the two that I've seen so far. The other would be the decatonic blues model. This model solves the problem of how three different dominant seventh chords can show up within the confines of one so-called key. I would define a model as a scale-like structure that offers various different options. If we can accept this idea, we'll find that the decatonic blues model clearly explains the sharp nine chord and where it comes from, and also the one dominant seven, four dominant seven, and five dominant seven showing up in a 12-bar blues. It also explains the mysteries of the blue note and the famous blues turnaround. So not only do we get chords from the negative harmony and borrowed chords idea, but a lot more is explained here as well. 
These other approaches simply do not clarify these other factors, as far as I can tell. Unfortunately, as much as I love the negative harmony idea, it has its limits. When you use negative harmony on extended chords, say a ninth chord, the results become less than pleasing. I tried using, for example, negative harmony on a sharp nine chord, and the result didn't give me a chord that was really practical or useful. Neither negative harmony nor the borrowed chords idea can explain what happens in the blues. Negative harmony is great for reharmonization of chords of a piece of music or finding interesting outside of the key chords. But the parallel relative switch system gets you there without having to jump through these intellectual hoops, figuring out formulas, or looking at graphs that negative harmony requires. In my system, it's simply a matter of comparing and blending two keys together. I see the blues as an inevitable historical outgrowth. The Greek mathematician and philosopher Pythagoras codified the major scale through scientific experiments with sound. Through the years, though, a problem was noticed. If we use that scale in its natural state, also called the untempered scale, we find that this scale cannot interact with the 11 other major keys. This is because of the notion of temperament. If you want to learn more about temperament, I'll refer you to Rex Whaler's book, The Story of Harmony. It's brilliant. If you don't understand temperament, you won't get the whole picture. However, temperament is a complicated notion that takes a lot of study and some mathematics to understand. But let me give you this analogy to at least give you a running start. Let's take, randomly, the D note. The D note can be found in seven different keys. Obviously, it could be in the first step of a key, the second step of a key, the third, and so on. So uh, we find this D note in the key of C, E flat, F, G, A, and B flat. With the naturally produced Pythagorean major scale, that D note is tuned differently in all seven of those keys. In other words, prior to temperament, there was no universal D note. In fact, there was no note that was universal to all 12 keys. Every C was different, every D was different, every E was different. The scale we use today, however, is retuned so that D note, and every other note for that matter, became universal to all 12 major keys. The bottom line here is that the 12 different major keys were incapable of interacting with one another entirely. For this reason, I call the Greek modes the system of isolated keys. Of course, they aren't isolated today because of temperament, but before box time, when temperament was agreed upon, keys were indeed incapable of interacting with one another. With the advent of temperament, the major minor key system was created with the emphasis on minor keys. In this system, new notes and chords can be borrowed from other keys. For the first time, new scales could be created namely the harmonic and melodic minor scale. Both of these scales require borrowing notes from other keys. And then later on, the more edgy scales like the whole tone scale or the diminished scale were created. Since the keys were now capable of interacting with one another, I call the major minor key system a system of interactive keys. So we move from isolated keys in the Greek modes to interactive keys in the major minor key system. Enter the blues. However innocently, the blues allowed for something never before seen in music. The blues gained popular awareness circa the time of the Industrial Revolution, and since things were speeding up at an incredible pace in every area of society, it seems that the music theorists didn't have a chance to catch their breath. Also, consider that since the blues was thought to be nothing more than a quaint folk music form, the academics didn't bother with a potential theory of the blues. No matter what the academics thought about it, the blues did something unprecedented. It took a minor bass scale and superimposed it on a major bass chord progression. It also took the restless dominant seventh chord, which prior needed to resolve somewhere, and said, no, the dominant seventh chord is the resolution chord. The dominant seventh chord now becomes the one chord. Also, the sharp nine chord is fully expressed via the blues. This chord cannot be gotten from a conventional diatonic scale. 
These weren't just minor tweaks to the corpus of musical expression. These were radical innovations. The fact that all of this went by nearly unnoticed is simply remarkable to me, especially considering that nowadays these blues conventions are now understood and used throughout the contemporary world and all over the planet. When you superimpose minor below major, you're blending two keys or at least two qualities together, the major and minor qualities. So summing up our thumbnail sketch of musical history, we can say that the Greek modes is a system of isolated keys, the major minor key system is a system of interactive keys, and finally the blues is a system of blended keys. Also to be noted is that the dominant seventh chord went through vast changes as we proceed through these different systems and these different eras of musical history. But here I'm emphasizing this approach I'm calling key blending. In my next video, I'm going to explain key blending and how it works from the perspective of the blues. From there, you'll see how this very much accords with the notion of borrowed chords or negative harmony. If you're wondering if such a thing as a blues theory and a blues system exists, keep watching. I promise folks who have an advanced understanding of music theory that this will be quite the adventure. Please note that I refer to borrowed chords as wandering chords in the ensuing video. It's just my own name for them and nothing more. I hadn't researched barred chords or negative harmony before I made that video, so you can transpose what I'm calling wandering majors as borrowed chords if you like. Thanks for checking in with my series and for your patience with my having to make revisions. I hope you really get something out of this.